Well, you know, every year the um, professional baseball players make their way to spring training, and it amazes me that athletes at that professional level start out with the most basic of things, as if they had somehow forgotten it or whatnot, and of course they hadn't, but there's some value, right, in revisiting the basics once in a while. Probably, if you've been in this church for any length of time, you think, well, Scott, you really kind of hang around the basics all the time. I would stand guilty of that, but I surely thought this morning, as we gather together and as we contemplate God's word, there's really just one thing I want us to be thinking about, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The foundation of our faith, uh, the reason for our salvation, the purpose of our being here, the gospel of Jesus. We knew uh, painfully what we couldn't do often during the last several months. And so we struggled at times to figure out what it was that we could do, especially as a church. We think, well, what can we do as a church? One of the ideas that we came up with was, well, we can read through the Bible together. We don't have to be in the same place to actually read the same pages and move through the scriptures together. And so the idea came that let's read through the New Testament. And I know that a lot of you have been doing that. Now, some of you right now, I just brought that up and you're like, I feel guilty. I'm behind. Listen, just forget that. Just pick it up now and move forward. Don't even worry about trying to catch up. The point isn't for you to tick every box every day to say that you got there. The point is for us as, as a body to try to get into the word and move through it together. That, that is the value of it, moving through it together and learning together even though we're apart and moving at the same pace, which by the way is a good reason for everybody to come to church every week because when we go through a book, we're moving through it together and we're learning together at the same pace. So that's what we chose to do. At least we said we can read through the New Testament and lots of you have been doing that. And uh, in our reading this week in Galatians uh, has taken us to that little book that the Apostle Paul wrote. And the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Galatians. You may have read, say if you have a study Bible or something, then you, you've already read the notes. But you may understand that Galatians was written to the churches in the region of Galatia to combat a heresy that had taken root there a form of legalism that, that people were beginning to believe and to preach that you also had to, in addition to the gospel, in addition to Jesus, you had to adhere to the Old Testament law. There were certain things you still had to do. And Paul wrote that book of Galatians to combat that heresy and to say that is, that is unequivocally not true. You, that is not true. You, there's nothing more you need to do. Jesus Christ has done it all. As I was reading through that little book of Galatians, which I have studied it before and probably you have too, so I knew what it was, I was still impressed by this little word that jumped out at me this time as I was reading it through. And I hope you're finding the value of reading through these books in one or two settings, these smaller books, because you really get to trace, trace the theme and the main ideas. Well, this little word, can you, can you guess what that word was in the book of Galatians that jumped out at me? Gospel. Do you know that in six chapters, that's in there 13 times? So I have a habit, and I encourage you to have that habit as well. When you're reading through the scriptures and you find a, a verse, a phrase, a repetition of a thought or idea or word, to circle it. It helps you understand what the, what the writer really is intending to emphasize. So if in six chapters we read gospel 13 times, we know that the Apostle Paul doesn't want us to lose sight of the gospel. Now that's a word that literally means a good message, or we've understood it to mean good news. But what is the gospel? What is the gospel that he's talking about? In another of his letters in 1 Corinthians and in chapter 15, Paul gives us probably the most succinct uh, stringent or strict, concise description of the gospel that we find in God's word. He said, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. In its simplest form, the gospel is simply the good news that Jesus Christ died as a substitute for our sins, that after being killed on a Roman cross, he was buried, and after three days, he rose from the dead, defeating sin 
and death. Now you might wonder why is the death of someone on a cross called good news? And if you are here today or listening and you have never heard the gospel story, it hardly seems like a good thing that someone would be killed, let alone in such a gruesome way. Why on earth is this good news? Because the someone who was killed, Jesus Christ, was God's own son. And he came from heaven to earth, and he took on human form. And in coming to earth, he did something none of us here can lay claim to. He lived a perfect life. He never once sinned. So consequently, he never earned the penalty, that, the punishment that sin deserves, which is death. He didn't deserve to die, but he chose to die. He chose to die on the cross. Indeed, that is why he came, in order to bear the penalty for sin in himself. And so the guilty who will believe in him, and we are all guilty, because he paid the debt of their sin, are now considered innocent. And those estranged from him, separated from God, and that is all of us because of our sin, who believe in him because of his sacrifice are considered righteous and are reconciled to God. And those who had as their future the prospect of eternal death and suffering in hell by Christ's atonement are pardoned and given the gift of eternal life. So the gospel is the good announcement that in Jesus Christ a perfect obedience to God was achieved and in his death a perfect guilt offering for sin was made. Sins were paid for, righteousness was completed, and the, this perfect righteousness is offered freely to those who will by faith receive it. And, and here's where we find our way back to Galatians, why Paul was so adamant that no one be deceived into believing that good works would earn them salvation from God. No one can be good enough in this life to merit eternity in the presence of God. Friend, do not bank on what you perceive to be your good record to swing wide the doors of heaven. Certainly don't rest on your calculation that when you total up your life's work, and I find so many people who sort of approach the idea of, of eternity this way, when you total up your life's work, you figure, well, I think the good outweighs the bad, and therefore I probably am going to make it in. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm counting on. Listen, perfect righteousness is required to dwell with God. Not that you've been pretty good. <laughs> That's not standard. Perfect righteousness is required. And God's word declares that amongst humanity there is none righteous. Not one. The Bible says that. Not one. Guilt in one part of the law translates into guilt of all of it. Do you know that? You transgress in one part and you're guilty of the whole thing. So where does that put you and I? Guilty of the whole thing. We are not perfect. Only Jesus was perfect. And in his sacrifice on the cross, he offers a great exchange, which is free to us. His perfection for our imperfection. His righteousness for our unrighteousness. This is what the Bible calls salvation. This is why the Bible calls it a gift. It's free for you to take for those who would receive it. No strings attached. No condemnation remains if you will just receive it. Only thing you get is freedom from sin and death. Eternal life. Now that is good news. That's why the gospel is good news. And the Apostle Peter tells us why Jesus did this. Verse 
Peter uh, 3.18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, listen, that he might bring us to God. That's, that's why Jesus did what he did, to, to put us back in a right relationship with the God who made us and the God who loves us and the God uh, from whom we are separated by our sin. But Jesus suffered to bring us back to God. And in Galatians 4, Paul fleshes this out a little bit more uh, in detail, explaining what it might look like. He says, but when the fullness of time had come, I love this passage in Galatians, but when the fullness of time had come, that is, when God's timing is always right, always perfect. He knows exactly when. And, the, and, and when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. A child of God. Apart from Jesus in our natural state, what this passage tells us is that we are slaves to sin. Now, that doesn't sound very flattering, does it? Very few people want to say, yeah, that's me. I'm a slave to sin. Especially in an unregenerate state, nobody's going to probably say, no, that's exactly it. I'm enslaved to sin. Sometimes even addicts struggle to admit that they're enslaved to sin. That's how much we want to retain our independence. But the scripture teaches that apart from Jesus, we are all, every one of us, slaves to sin. Jesus said this himself, John 8, 34, truly I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Apart from him, we are slaves to sin and, and, and all the garbage that is associated with that sin. Fear, guilt, anger, resentment, bitterness, broken relationships, Sin, apart from Jesus, sin owns us. Sin and, this, and all this stuff owns us, doesn't it? It dictates our lives. It drives us. It owns us. But Jesus came to redeem us, which is a biblical word that means to buy us back, to buy us, to, buy us, to purchase us out of slavery from sin. And he delivers us from our captivity to sin. And he changes our position eternally by faith, paying the ransom for us with his blood, lifting us out of slavery, making us children of God. And that is why John can say in his gospel, but to all who did receive him, like many rejected him, the light came into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light. But as many as did receive him, who believed in his name, to them gave he the power to become or the right to become children of God. So in Christ, beloved, you and I are not slaves to sin any longer. No longer slaves but sons. No longer slaves but daughters. God is for us. And God has made us his children. Joint heirs with Jesus. Joint heirs with Jesus. Forever. Jesus answered to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. We are not slaves. We are saved. We are children of God because Christ died for our sins. We thank you, Father, for your great plan of redemption formed before the foundation of the world through which we are called your children and by which we understand the great forgiveness and the love that by your grace is ours through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, when he made us sons and daughters, God, by extension, obviously, has made us a family. You don't get to choose your family. <laughs> your family is your family. And God has made us a family. One of the casualties of this pandemic uh, 
has been like literally the family meal, hasn't it? It's been testified to how good it is to get back together with people. It's been one of the casualties of the pandemic as a family meal, or, or in, in our case, like in my house, it'd be the extended family meal because it seems like as far as whatever emanates from 25 Willow Street, everybody's family. <laughs> so if we're having something going on, just come over. It doesn't matter whether I, it's more than once I've told you I've walked into Thanksgiving or Easter celebration and been introduced to people, and there's no problem with that. So, but we've missed that, haven't we? That's been a tough, that's been tough. And one of the meals, obviously, that we have missed greatly is a meal that we're about to take together, which we call communion or the Lord's Supper. And we're gonna ready ourselves for, for the bread and the cup this morning. Um, I'm not gonna be able to choreograph this for you. Um, we're just gonna to have to be patient and come up and it's almost, it should be very self-explanatory. <laughs> There's a cup with a piece of bread in it. There's a cup with a bit of juice in it. They have been prepared carefully by masked, gloved, safe people. If you still aren't comfortable coming up and grabbing a cup uh, or two here, don't worry about that. That's not a problem. Um, but if you are, we're going to just ask you to come up uh, rather, um, I want to say not slowly, but carefully and keep your distance and back to your seat and just try to minimize the passing of traffic. We're not in a hurry. Um, but we'll ask you here in a minute to come up and take a cup of juice and the cup that holds the bread and then just bring it back to your seat because we will take it together. But before we do that, I want to, in terms really of getting back to basics, I, I would like for us to be reminded of who we are and what we've signed on for here at the United Baptist Church. It isn't just that Jesus has made us children of God. It goes beyond that. It's more blessed than that even in a way that we he has graciously knit us together as a church so we are children of God which is a beautiful thing and then we are a local expression of the body of Christ and as members of the local expression of the body of Christ we are in covenant with one another we are in covenant with God remember Jesus said this is my blood of a new covenant we are in covenant with God and we are in covenant with one another and so we're going to project the church covenant this morning and recite it together um, and after we do that, then we're going to receive the elements. Can everybody see that okay? All right. Well, we'll do our best. Now, don't worry about how this sounds, okay? Unison reading can be kind of funny, but um, we'll just do our best. Having, as we trust, been brought by divine grace to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and to give up ourselves to him, and having been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, we do now in the presence of God, angels, and this assembly most solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ. We will work and pray for the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We will walk together in Christian love, exercising affectionate care and watchfulness over each other, faithfully exhorting, encouraging, and entreating one another as occasion may require, loving each other even as Christ loved us. We will speak the truth to one another in love, refraining from gossip, and putting away all bitterness, anger, and injurious speech. We will be kind to one another with humility and gentleness, helping one another and forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven us. We will gather together faithfully in worship, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together or neglecting to pray for ourselves or others. We will train our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and by a pure and loving example, seek the salvation of our family and friends. We will rejoice at each other's happiness, 
and with tenderness and sympathy bear each other's burdens and sorrows. We will live carefully in the world, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, remembering that as God's children, save for his glory, we have a special obligation to lead new and holy lives. We will work together for the continuance of a faithful Christian ministry in this church as we sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrines, and strive for its advancement in knowledge, holiness, and peace. We will contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. We will, should we move from this place, unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.